um, just well, I want to say a little bit about uh, the uh, inspiration for being here today. So it really comes from well, many places, but two places primarily. So Marty and I edited this volume uh, that came out in January, and, and it's the, the title of our uh, symposium today, as well as the title of the book. And, uh, and contributed as well this year. Yes, we have uh, contributors uh, that, that are here, and it's a... Uh, it was one of the reasons that we wanted to begin to have this conversation, but in this particular case today, it's about our local partnerships. Cause, because if one, if one driver for this and one inspiration was the book itself, the other is the you know, 10 plus years of work that we've been uh, collaborating with, that there's, there's these kind of rich partnerships, uh, community partnerships, uh, partnerships with faculty, with students, uh, with activists, with community members, in Latinx communities. So we wanted to kind of, uh, when we uh, in sense brought this home here to UMass and, do, uh, and did this presentation, we wanted to focus on what's happening here. So the presentations today are really in Holyoke and Springfield and the region. What, what are we doing in terms of this kind of civic engagement in diverse Latinx communities and learning from social justice partnerships in action? You know, it says a lot about the, the frameworks that we're going to be using today uh, in our conversations. and presentations and dialogues. And then the last thing I just wanted to mention that again, being in an academic context, oftentimes these kinds of partnerships are not seen as knowledge production and we want to argue that they are. They're new forms of understanding, new forms of theorizing, new forms of uh, developing new practices um, and, and knowledge about what's happening in these communities and how it's also challenging these institutions that oftentimes are, again, very heteronormative, also very Western, that don't necessarily uh, bring into communities of color into those conversations. And so we really want to try to challenge that and say, no, there's actually really amazing and critical work that's taking place that is, is really also, again, formulating new forms of understanding that's important to document and recognize, which the book attempted to do with various different partnerships across the country, um, all written by Latinx-identified uh, faculty uh, from variety, Chicano, Dominicana, Puerto Rican, um, Mexicanos, but also in terms of the communities themselves that are pan-Latino and multi-ethnic as well and multi-racial. So that's an important piece. Um, and so that's the other sort of impetus for trying to uh, both do the book but also bring all our collaborators and friends um, together. So without further ado, we're going to move forward to the first panel. Okay, so, um, so our first panel is, is called Building Partnerships for Community Learning. And the panelists will discuss two innovative partnerships that have developed to support community-engaged learning, culturally sustaining pedagogies, and local capacity building. The partnerships are UMass Amherst College uh, of Education collaboration with the Holyoke Public Schools Ethnic Studies Program, which we'll hear from first, and then the Holyoke Community College's collaboration with the Planting Literacy Project at Holyoke Chicopee Springfield Head Start. Thanks. All right, thanks. Um, it, I'm sitting here, and I'm feeling a, a mix of uh, excitement and nerves. I feel like my heart's going to explode. Um, and while Madi and Joseph were talking, I had a flashback to an episode of Family Ties where Alex P. Keaton just froze when he realized that he was being filmed. So <laughs> I looked up and I was like, <laughs> I hope that doesn't happen. All right. So now that we got that out of the way, um, my name is Dana Altschuler and I work in Holyoke Public Schools and I'm um, in the role of Ethnic Studies Coordinator. Um, thank you, Madi and Joseph, for inviting us to be on this panel. And today we're going to speak about a community partnership between UMass and Holyoke Public Schools, and I'm going to do a lot of reading because I'm super nervous. Before relocating to Holyoke Public Schools, I was coming from San Francisco and teaching in SFUSD, where at the time, myself, myself, along with a small group of teachers, were invited to be part of an ethnic studies collaborative, working closely with a professor from San Francisco State University to develop ethnic studies curriculum to then pilot in five schools across the city. Our students, a panoply of cultures representing African American, Latinx, and Asian Pacific Island communities became the intentional center of the ethnic studies curriculum in the context of San Francisco. Through this transformative work, I had seen firsthand students engaging with an ethnic studies curriculum that centered their identities, communities, and experiences. So in coming to Holyoke Public Schools, I can never go back to any, quote, traditional way of being in the classroom because through ethnic studies for the first time in my life as a white educator in the public school system, I was able to see clearly that what we really mean by upholding, quote, traditional curriculum and practice is to partake in the project of sustaining white supremacy. In Holyoke today and five years ago, this idea still seems so radical and offensive to many of my colleagues, which makes ethnic studies all the more relevant in this context. 
And so our curriculum in Holyoke Public Schools seeks to bring the histories of Puerto Rican people living in the diaspora out of the margins and into the center. Ethnic studies is part of a larger project to expose and dismantle white supremacy. Ethnic studies gives language so that students can name inequity to transform. Ethnic studies helps us to imagine new ways of being in a world otherwise dictated by colonialism, capitalism, and racism. Ethnic studies gives permission to educators to love their students, to hug their students, to connect with students in ways that contradict, quote, traditional relationships in our schools. All of this to say, ethnic studies is critical in holy of public schools. In 2016, I was introduced to a UMass professor from the Social Justice Education Program, Antonio Martinez. He became a quick mentor supporting the work of ethnic studies in Holyoke Public Schools. And through him, I was introduced to Joel Arce. Joel has become a brother in this work, uh, picking up where Antonio left off, continuing to push this work beyond the four walls of the classroom and into the community. Um, in the past year, Joel and I have worked with intention to bridge ethnic studies in Holyoke Public Schools to UMass with a particular focus on dual enrollment, college access, and teacher professional development. And that's what we're here to talk to you guys about today. Um, I just want to quickly take you through some of the slides that we have here that show the trajectory of the academic programming of Holyoke Public Schools from 2013 to the present, starting with an eighth grade curriculum. Um, it was in my uh, eighth grade ethnic studies English class um, where we piloted some ethnic studies curriculum. It was received well by students, and then by 2014, we spread to two other classrooms. We left the uh, English and we went into social studies classrooms um, by 2015-16. What does it say there? Eighth grade. Eighth grade. All, thank you. All eighth grade um, uh, social studies classrooms across the district. We're now teaching a eighth grade uh, ethnic studies curriculum. 2016-17, we moved to the high school, ninth grade, and we also spread to the seventh grade. And so here we are in 2019, 18-19 school year. We have ethnic studies in our seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh grade classrooms. Um, this year we'll be piloting our first dual enrollment class in uh, collaboration with Westfield State. So thank you, Wilma, for connecting us. Um, and so there's a lot of work happening. We have about 1,000 students um, in, enrolled in ethnic studies classes in Holyoke Public Schools right now. Um, I think there's one other slide. Um, so just a quick comment about our curriculum. Some of our anchoring questions that weave across the 7th and to 11th grade curriculum and then next year the 12th grade will roll out um, deal with the themes of causality, solidarity, resistance, and action. And so one of the first questions we are working on with students is how did systems of power and oppression become institutionalized in the United States and how are these systems upheld over time? In regards to solidarity, in what ways are people of color and marginalized groups both in the US and abroad impacted by a legacy of colonization? In regards to resistance, what have people of color and marginalized groups and young folks done to organize movements that challenge the status quo? And then making it local in regards to action, what action can Holyoke High students plan, organize, and implement to resist systemic oppression in our own city and schools? Thank you. Hi, morning, everyone. Morning. 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 Um, so I'm, um, thank you, Dana, um, for just setting the context um, for the, the, the conversation this morning. Um, where, where I want to pick up off of is um, two years ago um, in the 2016-2017 um, school year, and the introduction um, that, that led to the kind of the fostering of this partnership that we have today. Um, and thank you for, for naming Antonio, because um, that was central. Um, and so was um, Jerica as well, who um, was the original um, program director of the Restorative Justice Program over at Holyoke High School. Um, and you know, I, I think it's important to name those folks because um, I think it's through that um, that led to this collaboration that, that you see here today. Um, and so it's this mixture of, I, I think um, I, I would call it like maybe some like organic relationship building that happened there, but also just like a willingness um, on the on behalf of the program to bring, bring folks into the fold um, because of our mutual connections, but also because of our mutual interest. Um, I have to say that um, when I came in in 2015 as a doctoral student um, to UMass, um, I didn't walk in with specific intentions to um, engage in work related to um, ethnic studies at the school level, but it made sense for me um, uh, to, to do this work and engage in this kind of, kind of work in a local school context because of my, just of my prior interest in political education and social movements. Um, but through the initial meetings that we had um, back in 2015, uh, back in 2016, I'm sorry, um, you know, we had an opportunity to just kind of connect 
and through that, and I, I also had the opportunity to meet the ninth grade teacher um, that was implementing the pilot, um, the pilot curriculum for the ninth graders that were just about to begin um, uh, the first inaugural, uh, inaugural year of ethnic studies over at Holyoke Kai. Um, so that led to me kind of being able to have the opportunity to go into the classroom. And personally for me, and after a year in, in the program, um, I was a little thankful to be able to have the opportunity to go back into the classroom. Um, for me, it was to see ethnic studies being pushed in a predominantly Puerto Rican community, and to see that happening was, um, it moved me in a particular way, and, and just also the opportunity to work with young people. Not to mention the fact that um, getting a brisk reminder of you know how early the school day starts, um, uh, and thinking back to my teaching days, that was you know that was that was a quick reminder. Um, but I, I really did appreciate the opportunity to just be in there and see it happening and being able to kind of work alongside students in, in an informal way. Um, but by the end of the school year um, and later on in the school year, Dana had asked me to get some student input and feedback um, to hopefully inform the program and the curriculum. So eventually, um, I got the opportunity to do some interviews with several students who took that class to kind of corroborate some of my informal observations there. Um, as we went into the, the next following year in 2017, 2018, um, I would say that's where we really, really picked up our conversations and collaboration um, with it focusing a lot on how this can be, uh, I'm gonna say a mutually beneficial collaboration. And, and that was, I would say, is, was a central topic of most of our conversations. Um, I think it guided us, I wouldn't say it was central, but it guided our conversations throughout the entire year. Um, and I meant through, through the entire year as well. It wasn't just this one off. Um, but my interest in aligning my research as a doctoral student um, with supporting the program and reflecting on what was, like that, that was just obvious that I wanted to align my research in terms of supporting the program. Um, and for Dana, from what I took away from our conversations, it was an interest to see how, to see how UMass and my personal interest could push the program. Um, through its support and through its research. Um, so that's kind of what set the context for the beginning of the school year. Um, one of the main takeaways from those student reflections that I talked about um, that happened at the end of the first inaugural year um, was this need for more intentional curriculum that's reflective of local context. Um, and for students to see a lot more of a fluid link between their local context and the ethnic studies curriculum, um, both on a historical historical tip, but then also just in a present day um, level as well. So that was something that we really wanted to strive toward to make that a little bit more fluid and intentional in the curriculum. Um, before I get to this, uh, before I, I talk about this part, I, I think it's important to note that um, prior to me even, prior to us even like starting our collaboration, um, Dana had started to develop some of those, um, uh, had done some of that outreach prior and been able to start those conversations with Quite frankly, with some of the folks that are in this room right now, so um, thinking of like Wilma Flores, I'm uh, over at Westfield, Janetta, um, Maria, um, also over thinking about like Johan over at the Gandara um, after school program, the media literacy program. So that was stuff that was already kind of starting to happen, but I think what was significant about that year is that we were looking to expand that um, and make community engagement a central component to the curriculum. Um, so essentially, what we were talking about, what, what I think we were talking about was capacity building for community engagement. So how do we get to the point where this is a sustainable and central part of the program? Um, on my end, um, thinking of how I could support that, I think it was mostly about relationship building um, with higher ed staff and faculty, which in my mind um, was definitely about leveraging my position as a doctoral student, and I think that's something that as graduate students being in an institution like this or wherever, whatever institution that we're at, I, I think that's something that should be in the forefront of our mind of how are we leveraging our posi positionality and thinking about like what, what do we have access to, um, but also um, just trying to build relationships with like local community-based organizations in the area. Um, and I saw this as like a precursor to implementing like this vision for community-engaged learning and for social justice for the program. Um, I'm gonna, I want to highlight the, just the program, just, just um, uh, as a visual representation of kind of some of the partnerships. I know some of the lettering might be small, 
um, something, you know, we'll, we'll figure out kind of how to make the visual pop out a little bit more. But I think what we're trying to just point out here is just the different types of partnerships that's, that, that have been happening here um, and what it looked like in 2017 with, again, the main goal being building capacity for future programming, but still allowing students who are currently in the program to still ex have learning experiences that's both engaged in community-based learning, but also kind of giving access to local higher ed, um, higher ed institutions. Um, so this looked like field experiences that we started um, last school year, um, where we got an opportunity to kind of um, uh, build relationships and introduce students to local organizations, like Nuestras, um, uh, Nuestras Raices, Nueva Esperanza, uh, continuing with um, Gandara and Enlace as well. Um, in terms of, I, I think, on an exposure level, but also for the program to start building that relationship. Um, and also just continuing to think about, like, how can we, again, leverage these, these partnerships with, with higher ed institutions. So that looked like working with Westfield, with UMass, with HCC, continuing to do that. Um, but th that's, that's what it looked like in the last school year. And again, this is something that we're going to continue to build on. Um, I'm going to... I'm going to end on a, just talking about kind of a, a little bit more of the alignment in terms of um, just like the research and thinking about how it can support a program. Um, I, I think what I was thinking about was how do we channel this capacity building for a critical research agenda, and that's, that's what I would call it, a critical research agenda. Um, that's mutually beneficial, um, but that's also about producing knowledge outside of university silos, um, and I think that happens a lot. I think it's a comfort zone for a lot of folks, and, and I've noticed that, and I think for me, it's also easy to just continue to do that and fall into that little silo where it's just, it's just happening there. Um, so I, I, a lot of the conversations, and it was a lot of conversations that we had about that conversation of how do we build this in which it's a mutually beneficial collaboration, um, but it's also how do we move towards like a consensus and a way that we, we see see it pushing the program. Um, a lot of the conversations really built off of each other, so I, I'll give just one example. Um, uh, you know, we started the, some conversations about like college access programs and dual enrollment, but then that immediately, that not, not immediately, but as the year progressed, it became a conversation about, you know, how do we do college access programming? And then you had Dr. Mwangi come in um, along with me and another graduate student to do some after school programming work. So just I think the willingness to understand that conversations can go in, in different directions here. Um, I want to pass it along to, to Laura um, uh, and, and I'm going to go back to the other side so that Laura can speak on one of the partnerships that also uh, kind of developed from these conversations which is the capacity building but on the level of teachers and thinking about how can teachers support this um, uh, community engaged learning and that was going to speak a little bit about that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> In the sake of time, I think I'd, I will actually focus on the, the significance of the partnership for myself as an academic. I would like to acknowledge that I am here thanks to the collaboration with um, my colleagues, Kisha Green and Kaisa Nye Green, aside from you know, the team members here. Um, the ideas of this presentation are enriched by our collaboration, our work together. However, this presentation right now offers my own perspective as academic in this partnership with the Ethnic Studies Program at Holyoke. Today, I present to you a little glimpse of what the partnership means to me as an academic. I'll begin by stating that uh, engagement and partnerships constitute intense experience for those, I'm sorry, intense experiences for those involved. So th that's uh, a given. Uh, this is particularly true for academics like myself and my colleagues who bring expertise and commitments concerning critical issues of academic authority, power differentials, and social justice. Our work on the field allows us the opportunity to test ideas, but also to challenge theory and transform our own understandings and practice. In general, as academics, we have been main, mainly socialized as experts who bring their contributions in the forms of ideas to others in academia and outside academia. There is a great deal of this work that takes place on paper via our own publications. However, partnerships take place in a different dimension, especially for the academic 
whose work is about contesting power in order to build social justice. Partnerships are necessarily the experience by which we become vulnerable. With a clarification that this vulnerability is not generated by any sort of masochism, it's not like we want to be vulnerable, if I can use the term, but the conviction that with partnerships, critical academics enter a space where they ought to embody not only intentions, but also actions. Their actions should defy power differentials towards the construction of genuine, democratic, participatory, socially just relationships. If we are not willing to become vulnerable and we're, we don't hold such conviction, then partnerships may be the wrong place for us. Therefore, it is important to understand that as partners, academics are essentially learners. For me, being part of this project on youth-centered professional development for ethnic studies teachers in Holyoke involved going through the experience of making mistakes, even with good intentions, with experience of feeling rushed and subjected to institutional deadlines, all at the same time. My process to become part of the present project began by inviting different academic partners in order to put together a grant proposal to work with the Holyoke High School ethnic studies program without being able to fully involve the school in the design of the proposal. Although the proposal sounded good on paper and it proposed a coherent vision of my academic view, it did not represent the ethnic studies program's main purposes and needs. From the academic point of view, in a world where we are rewarded for grant proposal submission, it did not matter if the grant proposal matched the actual needs or plans of the potential partner. In the world of partnerships, this match mattered above all. What can we do when we incur in such mistakes? Luckily, in my case, my future partner was willing to talk even after the proposal was submitted. And one of our colleagues now here initiated a communication with, invited me to talk with my future partner, Dana. And of course, it, I was eager to have that conversation. It was much needed. And this story gets even brighter because the conversation with my potential partner following a mistake was about drawing boundaries, acknowledging mistakes, of course, understanding and repairing. And also, this conversation allowed us to generate new ideas. So when we came across a second opportunity for a grant proposal, we as partners now were ready to prepare an excellent proposal together. So our story is far from over. But let me go back to the idea of vulnerability. It's, it's an idea, but it's also action. The action of becoming vulnerable may be a challenge for us academics, but when it comes to rewards, I can say that becoming vulnerable for the academic dedicated to partnerships in social justice can be exceptionally rewarding. That's all. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And we are standing because my nerves has to go for my feet because you know, this is not working. Um, as you can see there in the picture, that is one of our classrooms. Our slogan is educating parents to educate their children. And this is planting it as a program that we have uh, with this magic guy, and I will explain that. The first thing that I wanna say is thank you to the angel to these migrant community mothers. It's Raul Gutierrez, the person that is go doing incredible, incredible job. So yes. Um, everybody knows what is Head Start, but probably no everybody know that Head Start have a migrant program that is called Migrant and Seasonal Program we offer. Uh, we start since 2005, um, and we have room for 125 children whose parents work in agriculture. Our children start, and that is probably another information that no everybody knows, our children start since one month old, that young, until of course five years old. Their service, is, the service that we provide to these families is since five in the morning to five in the afternoon. Mm. 
and that is neat because these uh, farmer workers uh, were really long hours, uh, probably you know. Um, and this is, of course, covering the need, the big need that this parent has. Um, a Head Start doesn't not only offer education for the children, if no, we try to cover every single need in the families. Sometimes not, not directly Head Start, but do, we use a lot of partnerships with different communities, and they are helping us to cover the needs. 90% of our parents or our community are from Guatemala. They are almost all of them undocumented. And many of them came to the country. Uh, probably my older family is 15 years in the country, and almost all of them came from the desert. Parents are uneducated. They have only just a short experience in school. They probably received no more than two years in the school. And actually, some of them um, received education in a dialect. So you cannot believe this, but some of the families came to United States speaking in a dialect, and they learned how to speak Spanish in the United States. Um, it's difficult for children to get a head start at home when parents are uneducated. Uh, we use different assessments and surveys to know about the needs. Um, and that is how we know when we are doing a, an irregular intake, how we know that these parents need to learn how to read and write. And first, and the experts, you, it's probably as many of the professors and teachers here, experts say that to dominate a second language, you have to dominate your original language. And we are talking about that these people has probably an a dialect also. So that is how we start this program. Uh, the initial survey gives the numbers to see how many of these people is needed. Um, we start recruiting more families, um, a, and we are looking for support about who can fund us, a, and we find Community Foundation in the first year. We started in 2015. Uh, community Foundation was at the initial um, start uh, we start with around 25 parents. Um, we provide a lot of logistics, uh, like a, a transportation uh, for these parents, because you know that these parents doesn't have transportation. And some of them do, but don't tell anybody. They have to ride without license, and that is more dangerous. That's another project that one day we will start. Um, we are offering a class that is 90 minutes. Uh, they receive a dinner in the beginning. Uh, they have a half hour for the dinner because they are coming straight from work and they are really hungry. So they really enjoy the first dinner and be ready with some candies because that makes you a lot of energy for <laughs> receive that class. I know, I made sure that always is a cake or chocolate there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we offer transportation, we offer the dinner, we offer child care because they cannot leave the ch children in home. So we offer the child care too. Um, in the beginning, we started in 2015, we started with uh, Spanish classes. That was the beginning. But uh, we advanced pretty quick. Uh, we probably later talk about what the challenges are, but pretty quick. In the second year, we include ESL as a basic. So we continue with something that we call transition to ESL that was kind of dual language. Um, that is Raul instructor for that class. And we have another retired uh, professor, I think, um, uh, that is doing an ESL class. Uh, attendance is always uh, really important. And the reason is uh, because we have to make sure that these um, students First, learn how to be a student again. And second is, they are really tired, but we have to make sure that they attend the class. That is the clue. And everybody and the students know more about that. Usually we do, at the end of the year, evaluation or assessments that permit us uh, to know how much they advance and how, or how different we have to work in the next step, for say. So, Raul. 
So um, when we started the program, uh, we started with Spanish. So uh, I'm trained as a foreign language teacher. Uh, so the, the issue that we ran into, it was the levels, and we had some of the parents that didn't even speak any Spanish at all. Uh, so what we're trying, what we were trying to do was uh, anchoring like the goals, the academic goals for the students and the planting literacy and the goals for the volunteer slash Latinx studies, which didn't exist. It still doesn't exist. It's in curriculum right now. So the, uh, what we, uh, where did I found my students were in my Spanish classes slash the Latin, uh, the Lisa Club, which is the Latino study, the Latino club at HCC. So well, how do you uh, do that? So we did exploration. The students would do, the planting literacy students would do self-practice, self-advocacy was the goal as the ma major goal. And in return, our students would get the ability to self-advocate for themselves also. Uh, and organic community en engagement. A lot of the students that I had I did have a DACA student that was participated in this until she's a BART now, so I'm really happy for her. So, uh, and she participated throughout the whole project, and it was creating cultural humility for our students when they go out into the field, understanding that even though maybe they're different and so on and so forth, and we made sure to create community because we had dinner with our students. We would sit, and we wouldn't call, call them students, even though you want it. For me, but we would sit together, have uh, have dinner together, and then after that we would have class. Uh, the woman that she's mentioning is a 77 year old woman that's taking Spanish classes for five like this since I was hired, and she keeps taking them over and over again. She's in my Latino lit class now, so so and I keep telling Dora like, and she was an ESL teacher and she's retired, so she was at it, and so cultural awareness uh, for the students. Uh, regarding rights, especially in the era of Trump now. We were not in the era of Trump back then, but uh, we create this sense of understanding what are your rights within the framework of the uh, instruction, cultural awareness for our students. And our goal in connection to this was creating a Latin Latinx studies curriculum at HCC. I don't know if you know, uh, if you're aware, but HCC is a Hispanic serving institution. We have, uh, that means that we're over 25% of the, our population is Latino, majority Puerto Rican, obviously. So we're trying to create something that it's representative of their knowledge, of their understanding of the world. Uh, so, and the main goal for the land planting literacy, I'm rushing because we have a video. So is teacher, uh, the parents becoming their primary teachers and self-advocating for themselves and their children. Uh, so, um, also, I wanted, uh, we had other, we have other partnerships uh, that are really successful. So we had uh, partnerships, and I want to thank Laura Valdivieso because she did help at the start of this project. Because I'm not an educate, I'm not in college of, or education. So I asked her, "Do you think this might work?" And she actually provided feedback, uh, and was really helpful. Uh, so we have this. Uh, we uh, wrote a grant, which was the Bridging Cultures Grant, Latino Studies in the U.S., that began uh, in 2015. Uh, and it was be, uh, created to train our faculty members from different uh, disciplines regarding Latino studies. And we were lucky to have great facilitators, Mari, Joe, Pineta. Uh, and I want to thank Dr. Jonathan Rosa. He's no longer here. He's in Stanford that helped us write the grant and lead. And Dr. Luis Marentes, which he also helped in the Spanish department with us. So we created uh, the creation of the Latinx program strengthens the relationship with uh, our one of our main transfer institutions, which is UMass, and also st uh, strengthen the uh, relationship with our Latino community surrounding. Because sometimes at HCC we have, we're in the hills, we're up there, and sometimes our students don't feel welcome when they get there, and so we're just trying to create, put the community back in community college. Uh, so. And as a, as a result of the grant, we were able to create like really fruitful relationships with the Holy Public Library, especially with Aline Crosby, uh, the archivist. Uh, so we cre uh, we've been doing a service learning component in my classes. For example, Nuestros Senderos, we've been translating some of, the, some of the data that she collected. And also I've been part of uh, the committee of the Saberes Poder, Resources of Puerto Rican Latinx History, which culture and social movements, which is basically creating this repository of knowledge for the community members in Holyoke for them to be able to check out books about their own history. Uh, so, where are we now? This is going through curriculum next week. 
It's already been approved. This is our uh, Latinx studies at ATC. Uh, so, and it's basically, we are requiring a capstone civic engagement project, or a whole semester of civic engagement for all our students that take this. And we want to create a pipeline, possibly from our schools in Holyoke and the schools everywhere. Because I would say Holyoke, and they're like, what, a, what about someone from where? And I said, well, they're welcome. Come on down. We want you all. Mm -hmm. And create a, a pathway from there to there. Continuing to work within the community, it, be it with the Guatemalan mothers that I'm not their hero, they're my hero because they do everything, I just show up. So, uh, but, and it's creating this sense and it, <laughs> our next step is creating a pathway for them, where do they go after ATC if they decide to get an associate's in this. Uh, so, if anyone is interested, and I'm like recruiting people, <laughs> just talk to me. So, but we have, this is going to start in fall 2019 if everything goes well. Okay. So it's again, it's really important for us to have moments of dialogues with each other. Um, and so we're actually going to combine the Q&A with the dialogue. So we actually want folks to be in dialogue together, but to also come up with questions that then we're going to be asking the panelists later on. We're also going to be posting. If you see little post-it notes in the middle of your tables, that's where both the questions will be asked, but also responses to the question that we're going to be asking, which is, what are the challenges and successes have you had in engaging and linking academic and non-academic community partners, students, uh, and social movements, perhaps in the work that you've been doing? So what are the, both the challenges and successes that you all have experienced? So we're going to do that for about 10 minutes, uh, and then we're going to move on. Um, we're going to, we may have time at the end for just a really quick questions, and we're going to have a quick break. Alrighty, so folks can, well, we're going to do that right now, so folks can uh, start engaging with each other at the table. Introduce yourselves to each other, please, if you don't know each other. Um, and we also want to invite the panelists to actually join some of the tables as well, so that if the questions do get asked, and spread out, so don't go to the same table. <laughs>